And this is basically the model that is going to be used over and over again, you know, for the next third of the semester and into the last part. Uh, the next section of the, of the class is really capital budgeting. So we're going to invest in capital budgets, maybe plant, equipment, real estate. We're going to figure out how much it's going to cost, what the cash flows are going to be from that, uh, that equipment or that asset or an X period of time where we would sell off the equipment at some salvage value or maybe sell off the real estate or sell off the firm at some point in the future. And then we're going to discount that back up to the present to get the present value, <coughs> the internal rate of return, net present value, break even. Um, later on, we'll use that to, to value stocks uh, in the, the applied session of the course. So the discounted cash flow model and the capital budgeting experiment exercises are the same. If you're buying a piece of equipment, buying a piece of real estate, buying a firm, buying a stock, the methodologies are exactly the same. Okay? That's why it's so important to understand that. Okay? And I call this, this part, this part of the class that the, what I'm setting up here is called financial integration. Okay? Financial integration. Why do I call it financial integration? Because it integrates all of the courses in your finance concentration in one lecture. Okay, because it's all combined. It's all related to each other. Uh, but they don't teach you how it's all related. They teach it to you in sections and in chapters. And you don't really see how it all flows together. Okay. Uh, so the first step in financial integration is determination of interest rates. And how do we determine interest rates, nominal interest rates? And you should know this because it was on the exam and it was in the homework and it was on the take home and it was in the in class. And blah, blah, blah. So how do you determine nominal interest rates? Real plus in, uh, expectations of uh, inflation expectations. Exactly. So, so it's real rates of return. Uh, plus inflation expectations is going to determine the nominal interest rate. Okay. And let's say we do that over maturity of securities, of government securities. And we can calculate the yield to maturity. And if we calculate the yield to maturity for each maturity by government securities, what do we get? What is it? It's the yield curve. Okay. And do real interest rates move a lot in the short run? Yeah. Uh, they do not. They do not. So what drives interest rates up and down and the yield curve up and down? Okay, over here, you guys. Over here. Engage with me. Uh, if inflation expectations go up, then nominal interest rates go uh, up or down? Uh, up. Okay. And will, if inflation expectations shift up along the curve, will the curve shift up? Will the yield curve shift up if inflation expectations yeah. increase across maturities? Yeah. Yes, they will. Okay. And if inflation expectations go down, will the curve shift down? Mm -hmm. Yes. <coughs> And what, what are these interest rates called also? What are they also called? They're called nominal interest rates, but they're also, they're also called what? Yeah. Uh, no, I'm looking for a specific. And you probably want to write this down. Because again, I hear in class, I ask these questions like eight weeks later, and they still don't know that this is the risk free rate. It's also called the risk free rate. Okay. So movements in inflation expectations moves the curve, the yield curve, up and back. Now, can the yield curve flatten? Yeah. yeah. And then when it flattens, what's the Federal Reserve doing? What are they doing? Are they buying or selling bonds? What? Buying or selling? Selling. Selling bonds. It's going to cause bond prices to go down and interest rates to go up. Uh, does the curve ever invert? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
And can the Fed oversell those bonds, causing bond prices to be oversold and interest rates on the short end rise significantly? Yeah. And when the curve inverts, how long do you have until the stock market peaks and we go into a recession? 12 months to the peak and 24 months, 24 months, months to the recession. recession. <clears throat> so, what are the what are the three theories? Or yield curve theory, theories? How many are there? Three. three. And what are they? And the most important <coughs> is it? Uh, no, that's just what it is. Well, what's the theory? The expectations hypothesis, which is the fish rate. So the key to understand here is that yield curves shift up, they shift down, they flatten, they invert. Right? Uh, will they have an effect on asset prices and the cost of capital? Yeah. Yeah. Because we you know CFO T plus one, if I goes up, do values go up or down? If I goes up, do values go up or down? Everybody should be participating in this. You need to burn this into the brain. CFO, T plus one, I minus G. If the growth, we think we're going into a recession, and we think the cash flows are going to go down in the future, what happens to values? Go down. <coughs> cash flow, T plus one, times the multiple, equals the value. Multiple goes down, then values will go down. Okay? And then we can do the same thing with the D DCF. Right? When the DCF, if interest rates go up, then what happens to values? If interest rates go up, then values go down. If interest rates go up, values go up. No. When interest rates in the discounted cash flow equation, the numerator, denominator, right? One plus I, if I goes up, what happens to the values? Goes down. Go down. All right, so we know what happens to the values. And we know that <coughs> all debt plus equity securities shifts up, the risk-free rate shifts up, and prices go down. If the yield curve shifts up, interest rates go up, and asset prices go down. Okay. <clears throat> if the yield curve shifts up, the risk-free rate goes up. If the yield curve shifts up, flattens or inverts, risk-free rate goes up. Now, what's important about that is that the risk-free rate is the base rate in the calculation for the cost of capital. Okay? The cost of debt and the cost of equity. And so what we're going to do is we're going to buy, we're going to buy a company. Okay? We're IBM, we're going to buy a company. So do well-established firms that generate a lot of cash, uh, buy other companies to grow. Yeah, they do. They buy other companies. Okay. So we're going to buy a company. All right. We're IBM and we're going to buy a company. Now, first thing we need to figure out is what is our cost of capital? If we, if we can 
figure out the cost of capital, then we can figure out the discount rate that we're going to use to discount the cash flows to make the investment decision. So we got to figure out the cost of capital. And we're going to figure out the cost of debt. And we're going to figure out the cost of equity. Now, are, I, are IBM bonds traded in the market? Does IBM, do you think IBM has issued a bunch of bonds over the last 50 years it's been in existence to finance its operations? IBM. I'm not talking about Google or Apple that have all cash. I'm talking about IBM. Do you think IBM has bonds that are currently being traded in the marketplace? IBM that's been around for like 70 years. Yeah, because when you mature as a company and you get stable cash flows, you're going to lever up the company. And why are you going to lever up the company? What are you trying to do? No, but what are you trying to do when you use leverage for the company? What happens? What, what, is, what happens to the uh, shareholder equity? The return on equity, does it go up or down? It goes up. Exactly. So if you're a well-established firm that's generating durable cash flows, wouldn't you want to lever up the, the company at one point to increase the return on equity? Yeah, to reward the, uh, the stockholders that have been invested in the firm. Okay. So yes, IBM has debt. And couldn't you figure out the cost of the debt? Because we're going to issue some new bonds and we're going to issue some new stock to be able to fund this acquisition. So couldn't we go out into the marketplace right now and look at the yield and maturity on existing bonds that's being traded right now in the marketplace? Might I be able to get an idea of what our cost of capital could be? Yes or no? Yeah. yeah. So we can go into the marketplace and figure it out. Okay. So we can figure out the yield to maturity on the corporate bonds for IBM. All right. Can we calculate the cost of the debt? What's the first factor that's added into the equation? What do you start with? I'm trying to build the cost of debt. Because we're going to issue bonds and we're going to issue stocks. So how do I figure out the cost of the debt? What's the very first variable that I add in the cost of debt equation to figure out the cost of the debt? Cash flow? Nope. Interest. What? Interest. What, what kind of interest? We've been talking about it for the last 20 minutes in the conversation. What have we, what have we been talking about the last 20 minutes? What have I been talking about? all interest rates. Okay, what are they also called? Risk exactly. So you're going to start with the risk rate. Okay. And then we're going to start tacking on what? What are we going to what are we going to start tacking on? Can IBM borrow at the risk-free rate? The United States government risk-free rate? No. So what are you going to have to tack on? What? Um, we could put on probably uh, a risk premium. We could probably add an inflation risk premium, although inflation expectations, as we know, are already embedded in the risk free rate. But maybe the bond is highly sensitive to movements in interest rates, so you need to attack on an inflation risk premium. Okay. Is there another risk premium that we should tack on? We're going to issue a seven-year bond. Okay. Does there need to be a risk premium associated with the maturity of the bond? Yes. So I'm going to probably add on another risk premium, and it's going to be a maturity risk premium. Okay. <coughs> Are IBM bonds as liquid <coughs> as U.S. Treasury securities? Are they as liquid? What's the U.S. Treasury security market right now for government debt? 19 trillion. Does IBM have 19 trillion in bonds outstanding, highly liquid? No. So would I have to add probably some illiquidity risk premium?
Can IBM default on its bonds if they go into a severe recession? Yes. Can the government default on its bonds? Uh, yes, but theoretically not, because they have uh, the printing press. You can always print money to pay the coupon interest and return the principal to the to the bondholders. So theoretically, no. So does IBM have a uh, credit default risk premium? Default risk premium. And do you think there are other risk premiums embedded in the cost of debt yeah. for IBM? Yeah, probably. Probably some others. Probably some others that are you know, on the margin kind of thing. Which one of these do you think is the biggest? And when, when trying to figure out the percentage, the cost of the debt, which one of these variables do you think is the most, is the biggest contributor to their overall cost of debt? Well, could be, could be inflation. Okay. What else? What is, what do you think is the number one risk premium? Default risk premium. Exactly. Exactly. <coughs> so we know that the default risk premium is the biggest one. And if we're using the seven-year treasury yield, does anybody know what the seven-year treasury yield is? I know that the 10 years are around 1.7, so the seven is probably going to be 1.5. Let's just guess, just use a number. We don't need to be accurate. 1.5 percent. All right. So do you think that the credit default risk premium is going to be less than 1.5? That's the risk-free rate, right? Yeah. So do you think it's going to be less than that? Could be equal to, could be less, could be a little bit bigger. So you want to use 1.5? 1.5? This is the risk premium, right? And then we're doing a seven year, right? So how many basis points do we want to add to the cost of the debt for the maturity risk premium? Because it is a seven year bond, it's not a three month bond. Or a 30 day commercial paper. How many basis points would you like to add? Does everybody know what a basis point is? If it's 1%, how many basis points? Okay, here we go. 100. Do you get that? If there's 0.5%, uh, how many basis points? 50. Excellent. Okay, excellent. So you have to put in basis points. So how many basis points do we want to add to this? Uh, that's too much. about illiquidity? It, it, it just guess. I mean, it doesn't really matter. It's just as long as you're not too too high or too low, you're going to be, it, it's a bounded rationality. Okay? It does, they don't vary in the ranges of very wide for most established companies, like an idea. So what do you think the illiquidity risk premium would be? 0.7? 0.7? Let's do 0.75. Right? So there's one two, three, so that's 4%. 4%. And you know what, I bet if you went right now and looked at IBM's uh, yield maturity on their bonds, so they have seven years left, or they just issued some seven-year bonds, it's probably around 4%. Okay. So you can get to the numbers pretty quickly and you're gonna be close enough. Okay, that's kind of the point I'm getting here, is you can get into the science of a lot of this stuff, but a lot of times you don't have time to put this stuff together. <coughs> Okay, now let's calculate the cost of the equity. Uh, what equation do we use to calculate the cost of the equity? What equation do we use? And again, this is all review, right? I'm still doing review. That's why it's called financial integration, is we're basically starting with the old stuff, moving through, and then expanding the, uh, the analysis to encompass other things and other new things. But we're, we're, we need to know this. So how do I calculate the cost of equity? Okay, if I'm a firm, I'm going to need to know my cost of equity. All right? If I'm an investor, I'm going to need to know my expected return on the equity. It's the exact same thing. So what equation do we use? Uh, rate. Okay, can you give me the equation? Oh, uh, I mean, what's it called? What's the model called? 
Okay, give me the equation. And maybe uh, we can get everybody to burn this into their brains and tattoo it on their ankles. Go ahead. I don't have those ankles. Okay. How do you calculate the cost of the ankle? The problem went over like three, four times in class. So what's the first one? What's the base rate? You were right. What's the base rate? Number three rank plus what? Data. You got it. Data. Market entry. Depending on the market. Uh, minus risk free rate. Minus risk free rate. Okay, what's the uh, equation called? What's the equation called? You have to memorize this because they will ask you in the interview. First thing they're going to come out do you know a standard deviation and do you know. capital asset pricing model to determine the expected return on the equity and the cost of the equity. There's other ways of doing it, but this is the standard that is used by the investment bankers. Because they're the ones who are going to be underwriting the security to bring it public, to take the season bond issues and the season stock issues to be able to raise the capital for us to be able to buy the company. Okay. <clears throat> All right, so what's the risk-free rate? What is it? <coughs> plus okay so we got two of the what two of the one two two of the four variables and off the bat all right uh, is IBM a big company uh, what would you think the beta is for IBM where does it trade does it trade on the Nasdaq or the uh, New York Stock Exchange I believe it's on the New York Stock Exchange. Yeah, but this, this company's been around a long time. Okay. They've been around before the satellites. Okay. It migrated to the New York Stock Exchange. So what do you think the beta is for IBM? Well-established firm, very large, a lot of liquidity. Everybody owns their stock, big company. What do you think the beta is? What's the range of betas? What can the beta range from? I mean, can it be negative 50? No. no. Okay. Are beta zero? Yeah. No. Can betas be 50? Yeah. Not really. Uh, a large company that's been around 70 years that's kicking off, off a lot of cash flow. Do you think the total return on IBM stock is highly correlated to the overall return on the S&P 500? Do you think that IBM's total return moves with the S&P 500. Do you think it moves with it? Yeah, it does. It probably moves really closely to it because the larger the firms, the company's beta is approximate one. Okay, approximate one. So what do you think the beta is for IBM? One. one. I mean, Google may be, and Yahoo, and those other Salesforce and the fast growing tech companies may have a beta of two because they don't pay dividends and they're highly volatile and they're in a highly competitive market but IBM has been around a long time and pays constant dividends and has done it for a long time and they've grown their dividends for a long time. So, so what's the average return on the market been for the S&P 500 for the last 10, 15, 20 years? What's been the average rate of return? Again, I've mentioned this like three, four times in class. So, <clears throat> what do you think the average return on the S&P 500 has been for the last, you know, 10, 15, 20 years? 50 percent? Zero? No. 25? No. No way. 5 percent? Maybe. 10? So now we have between 5 and 10. What's the average between 5 and 10? And you're going to be pretty close. So 8 minus 1.5 is what? 6.5. 6 
Okay. So our market risk premium is 6.5%. And 6.5% times one is what? 1.5 plus 1.5 is going to give you what? Expected cost of equity is eight percent. Is the eight percent higher than the cost of debt? Is the eight percent higher than the cost of debt? Yeah. Does that make sense that the equity cost would be higher than the debt? Yeah. Because who gets first claim on the earnings? Bondholders or shareholders? No. Bondholders. Bondholders. So the bondholders get the uh, claims to the earnings first. Do you think that the cost of the capital and the return on the bonds are going to be higher than equity if they get the first claim? No. So they're basically asset-backed bonds and collateralized bonds. So the yields are going to be lower. Okay, so you got to check it first. And then what about if the company goes bankrupt? Who gets the uh, proceeds from the assets? If they sell off the assets, who, who gets the proceeds? Bondholders or the stockholders first? Bondholders. Bondholders. Okay. And the company, does it, can the company deduct the interest that it pays on the bonds, and can it deduct the div dividends they pay on the, to the shareholders? Can they de deduct the interest on the bonds? Yes. Can they deduct the dividends? No. Okay. No, nope. they can't. So your dividends are subjected to double taxation. Okay. So you have all of these things that 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 debt has over equity, and your debt costs are always lower than your equity. And then preferred stockholders get precedence over yeah, they're, regular stockholders. Yeah, they, they're included in here, but the companies don't use a lot of preferred, so I'm not even going to get into it. Okay? It's a very small portion of their capital stack, or what is also called their capital structure. Okay? If you haven't read ahead in the chapters, but this is the capital structure, and that's what we're going to do right now. Okay? So the first thing you've got to do is figure out where interest rates are going to go and where the risk-free rate's going to go determine that because you're looking out and you're forecasting where rates are going to be in a year from now. Then you're going to use the capital asset pricing model to determine the cost of the equity. And you're going to use the risk premium. Risk premium. Risk premium or premium approach to figuring out the cost of the debt. Now I got the two components. Now I got to go over to the balance sheet, okay, and figure out the capital structure. Because okay, we're going to calculate the weighted average cost of capital, which is going to be used as the discount rate that we're going to use to discount the forecasted cash flows from the company that we're going to buy. We're going to see if we should buy it, and then make a decision to, not, to buy it or not. Okay, and then I'll walk you through that. So now what we got to do is figure out the capital structure. Company. So yeah, we're going to look at the assets. We don't use the assets to come up with the capital structure of the firm. Because the liabilities. What is the capital structure of the firm, and how are the assets financed by the liabilities? Do you try to match the maturities between? Asset lives and the maturity of the liabilities. You try to match those? Yeah. Yeah, you do. Okay. So let's say, uh, and do, do assets and liabilities have to match? Do they have to be equal to each other? Yeah. Do assets and liabilities have to match? Yes, they do, the matching principle. Okay, great. <clears throat> All right, and we're going to have short term, medium term long-term assets. We're going to have short-term, medium-term, and long-term liabilities. And let's say that the total value okay, of this company, now when you see the balance sheet, is that market the value of the assets and the liabilities or historical cost? Book value of the assets and the liabilities. Book value. So it's a historical cost. Okay. All right. And let's say that the company that we're looking at buying is a $10 billion company. Just to keep the math easy. 
So what did the liabilities have to be? How much does the liability, I mean, sorry, if the liabilities are 10 billion, then the assets are? 10 billion. 10 billion. Does anybody remember how most firms finance their assets? What proportion is going to be debt and what proportion is going to be equity on a percentage basis? How are most firms financing their assets? Do you know what the percentages are? I mean, do you think IBM has financed 70% equity and 30% debt? Or is it 70% debt, 30% equity? What do you think it's most likely? 70% equity, 30% debt, 70% debt, and 30% equity. Of the two, which one do you think it's most likely? 30% equity. What? 30% equity. 30% equity. Anybody else? Anybody else? I think it's more debt. It's more debt. 60. It could be 60-40. Yeah, I mean, it could be 60-40, it could be 30. 70 30. 70 30 is pretty high, so let's just use 60 40. Okay. So we got 60% debt and we got 40% uh, equity. Okay. So this becomes pretty easy, right? So 1 billion, 2 billion, 4 billion. Problem is, is what? Uh, we got long term debt, we got medium term debt, short term debt. What are we missing? In the liability stack, in the capital stack, in the capital structure. What else do we have here? We're not, it's not 100% liability. What else do we have? Stockholders. Yeah, we have equity, stockholders equity, owners equity. We have owners equity, and we said that owners equity, equity was how much? 40%? Yeah. So what's the, how many? Four. Four billion. <coughs> All right. All right. And then what would be the long term, how much the matching principles in place, what would be the value of the long term assets? How many? Do I use equity to finance long term assets? And then what about medium term? Two. Two. And short term? One. One. All right. Now this capital structure, and we'll assume that this is the target or the optimal. trying to target some optimal capital structure, what are you trying to do? What's your goal? What's the goal of the firm? Okay, what's the goal of the firm here in investing in the assets? What are they trying to get? What's the goal? When you invest in an asset, what's your goal? Maximize profit. Maximize Efficiency. return. Maximize return. Excellent. Uh, so we're going to try to maximize the internal rate of return, right? Assets. So what are we trying to do for the cost of the capital? We're trying to maximize that too? No, we're trying to do what? Uh, we minimize it. Minimize it. Excellent. We need average cost of capital minimized. And if you do that, you're going to maximize the spread. And if you can maximize the spread between the return on the assets and the cost of the capital boom, you've done that. You've maximized the value of the firm. <coughs> now, it's not in the book, which I think is a mistake, but you would get in your in intermediate corporate finance class, <coughs> is you would multiply this by the value of the assets, and multiply this by the book value of the liabilities, and you would get a dollar amount dollar amount of IRR on the margin minus
percent is the dollar amount of the lack, and you would get some dollar spread. Well, that dollar spread is called economic value add or EDA. Okay. When you listen to the analyst conference calls for any publicly traded company of a certain size, the CFO is going to be talking about economic value add. And it's basically the economic contribution on the margin to the firm. Are we creating value? And if it ever reverts and turns negative, you're in way big trouble. You're in big trouble. These spreads for these companies, on average, have to be 100 to 200 basis points. Right. So if you can target that over time, your company will live forever. You will be profitable, and you will maximize your shareholder value. Right. So now, we got the capital structure, we got the weights, and we now have the cost of the debt and the cost of the equity, so we can calculate the weighted average cost of capital. Or what is called lack. So you want to memorize lack, you want to memorize capital. Okay. So, we want to calculate the WAC, because the WAC is going to be used as the discount rate that we're going to use to apply to the investments that we are going to be looking at to be able to calculate the discounted cash flows and calculate the present value, net present value, and internal rate of return to make investment decisions. <coughs> so the first thing is, do we know what the cost of the equity is? Do we know what the cost of the equity is? What's the cost of the equity? What's the cost of the equity? No, 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 no. the cost of the equity. 8%. Okay. And what's the weight of the equity in the capital structure? What's the weight of the equity? What is it? 40%. Okay. And then what's the cost of the debt? Cost of the debt? What is it? Four percent. Okay. And in the book, in the book, does the debt have a tax shield? Do you have to pay taxes on the interest that you pay on the bonds to your bondholders? Can you deduct the interest paid on the bonds? Can you deduct the interest? Yes, you can. Okay. So is that a tax shield? You have to add in the tax shield. And what's the highest taxable corporate tax rate? Assuming progressive income tax on the corporate side? 35. It's like 35%? Yeah. All right. And then what's the weight of the debt? What's the weight of the debt that we're going to use? 60%. Okay. So what's my weighted average cost of What's 8% times 0.4? 8% times 0.4. Okay, you might want to pull out your calculators because when we do the discounted cash flows, there's no way you're going to be able to do it in your head. Okay? And neither can I. Okay. What is it? What is it? 8% times 0.4. 8% times 0.4. 0.32. So it's 32%. No, it's not 32%. What is it? It's 3.2%. Is that right? And what's uh, 1 minus 0.35 times 4 times 0.6? Again, you gotta get your calculators out. And you have to get your calculators out because when we do the discounted cash flows, I can't have three people doing all the calculations. I need presentation validation. And how are we doing on time, time keeper? 20 minutes. What's the calculator? What's this? I can't do this in my head. 0.0156. Okay, can you just give it to me in percentage terms? 1.56. Okay, so 
1.6%, is that correct? Is that what everybody's getting? Is that what you got? Yeah. 1.56? Yeah. Is that what you got? I don't know if that's You got to bring your calculator to class every class now. Go ahead. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. And then what's the total? What's the total? So can we round it up to five? So make it easy. So it's 4.8. do it without the tax shield? Because that seems really low as a discount rate to apply to projects. I think we're going to buy another firm. I don't think a 5% is probably reflective of the risk associated with that. So I may just back out the tax shield. If I back out the tax shield, would it be, would the discount rate be higher or lower? If I back out the tax shield, would higher. the discount rate be higher or lower? Higher. higher. Okay, it's going to be higher. Would that be more or less conservative? If I'm using a higher discount rate to calculate the net present values, would that be more or less conservative? Yes. Would be more conservative or less conservative? If I'm using a higher discount rate, would I be more conservative or less conservative? More conservative or less conservative? More conservative or less conservative? Less conservative. I would be more conservative. More conservative. Okay. So what's the discount rate backing out the tax rate? So basically 6%? Yeah. So what we're pro we'll use 6%, but usually do you want to use just one discount rate? When you're running investment analysis no. on a multi-billion dollar project, would you use just one discount rate? No. Or would you use a sensitivity of discount rates? Multiple. Probably use multiple. And would you use 567 or 678? What would be your sensitivity ranges? Would you use 567 or 678? 678. Uh, you might use 567. 678. If you use 678, would that be more conservative? Yeah. Yeah. Do you want to be more conservative or less conservative? No. You probably want to be more conservative. Okay. <clears throat> so let's just stick with the 6%. Okay, now we got the discount rate. Okay, so let's go do the deal. All right. So we're going to buy this company. Let's just use, just to make it easy, let's just use a five-year holding period, okay? Okay. One, two, three, four, five, okay, got it. <clears throat> and what is it? It's a $10 billion company, and it generates uh, $100 million a year. Last year, the company did $100 million in free cash flow. Okay, we're going to use EBITDA. We could have used earnings or something else, but it's a small company, and there's distortions in the earnings, so we're going to use free cash flow. We'll use EBITDA. And last year, they did $10 million in cash. Now we got to figure out the present value here. All right. So is IBM a smart company? And what was our discount rate? What was the discount rate that we were going to use to discount this company? Six percent. What is it? So I can set up the discount factors pretty quickly. <clears throat> and you should have a calculator and you should start calculating on that. Because I'm going to ask you for it. And what's this one? What's 1.06 cubed? What's 1.06? 1.19. And what's 1.06 to the fourth power? 1.26. And what's 1.06 to the fifth power. 1.34. So I've got a lot of the equation already done. Right? <clears throat> How fast do you think we can grow the revenues from last year to this year if IBM takes over the company? 
Can we grow the revenues? Can we grow, grow the cash flows by how much? You tell me. What do you think we can grow the cash flows? So IBM is a big company. It's got lots of infrastructure, a lot of really smart people, distribution channels, lots of technology. We could really lever up the cash flows, the growth rates. So what do you think we can grow the cash flows from last year to this year? What? You want to do 20? Is that pretty, that's pretty aggressive. <laughs> okay, so it's uh, 1.2 times 120 million. Well, you're the manager of this takeover. You're in a corporate finance department. You're going to be working with the restructuring team to get us that 20%, so you got to be right. <laughs> okay, what are we going to do in the second year? Usually, the Not second, and third, fourth, fifth year, you can't grow it as much. They taper down a little yeah, bit, Yeah, they right? taper down. So what do you want to use for uh, going from year one to year two? Next year to the next year. 15? Well, are you sure? 10? Okay, so what's 120 times uh, 1.1? 1 .1? What is it? 1 point, 122? Something like that? Is that right? 132. 132. Okay. And then what do you think we can grow the uh, cash flows to the next year? How much? We did 20, 10. Five. How much? Five. Okay, so what's 132 times 1.05? You guys should be doing this on your account. What is it? Okay. I need validation verification because last, one time I taught a class where we went through the whole freaking model and nobody told me that it was wrong. And I had to go back and redo it again. Can you imagine if you're in a board of directors meetings and your team is feeding you bad numbers? That would be awful. That would be awful. Uh, what do you think we can grow it out uh, to the next year? So what's 139 times 1.03? 143. And what about the next year? 1%. What? 1%. 1? 1.01? What is that? 144. Right. Now can I discount this back to the present value to make the decision? Or do I need to do something else? Cash flow is going to stop after year five, or are they going to continue into the future? They're going to continue. They're probably going to continue into the future. So what do we need to count on? It was on the last question on the exam. Any classes mm -hmm. Terminal value. We need to calculate the terminal value. Okay. And then how do we calculate the terminal value? So what do we need to do? You add it to the last. Yeah, but I need to do something first. What do I do now? This is the most important and most critical component of the whole class. Right now. So what do I do to the cash flow? Do I do anything? How do I get the terminal value? Cash flow plus one over interest rate, isn't it? Yeah, but I have to do something. Where do I get the cash flow? Do I use this cash flow or do I use another cash flow? write this down. You have to write this down. If you leave the classroom without knowing this, it's horrible. Okay? You have to write this down. You need to grow the cash flows out one more year. One more year. Okay? One more year. So what do you want to grow the cash flows out to? By how much? You already have it down to one. Do you use the same one or do you grow it out by 1% one more year? And then what is the, in T plus six, the cash flow in T plus six is going to be 144 times 1.01. 1. 01. And what is it? 145. 145 million. All right. Now what do we do? Is that the terminal value? Is that the terminal value? No. No? How would you calculate the terminal value? How do you calculate the terminal value? You calculate the terminal value. You calculated this in the very last problem on your exam. Use the Gordon growth. You can use the Gordon growth or, or what's 
the other approach we could use? Perpetuity. Or the perpetuity. We could use either one. <clears throat> With the perpetuity model, what do we assume about the cash flows? Are they going to grow at a constant rate into the future, or are they going to be flat? Flat. They're going to be what? Flat. Okay. Do you want to use cash flows that are growing at a constant rate into the future, or do you want to assume they're going to be flat into the future? Flat. You want to be flat? And if you assume that they're flat, are you being more or less conservative? More conservative. So you want to be more conservative? Because you kind of like yes. push a little bit more be conservative. <laughs> so what do I divide that by? What am I going to divide that by? What rate? No, which one? Which rate am I going to use? Which rate do I use? Do I use the risk free rate? Yes. Or do I use the weighted average cost of capital? Okay, what's the whack? Yeah, what's the, what's the rate? 6%. 6%. In six years from now, is the company going to be older or younger? Older. Is it going to be older or younger? Older. Older, okay. Is it going to be subjected to more or less competition in six years? More. More, okay. So does it make sense for us to use the same going in discount rate? Or should we add some risk premiums on top of it? to reflect the additional risk that we're taking. Because I can't predict what it's going to be like in six years from now. So to be conservative, shouldn't I want to tack on some additional basis points to reflect that additional risk? Yeah. So how many basis points do you want to add on to the going in discount rate to reflect the additional risk in six years from now? 100, 200, what do you want to use? 100. 100? So that would be what? 0.07, all right, and then what's 145 million divided by 0.07? Because we want to get the, uh, <coughs> the terminal value. So what's the terminal value? 2071. What is it? 2071. Like that? 2071. Two, 0.71, so 2 billion, 71 million. Tech companies going for a couple billion these days? Aren't, aren't tech companies going for a couple billion? Yeah. So we're not yeah. out, out of range here? Yeah. Okay, so now what do we do with the terminal value? Add that up. Do what? Add it. To what? The, the present value. You add it to the last value in the holding period, the last cash flow in the holding period. So what's 144 million plus 2,071? Million. So what's the cash flow in the last year of the holding period? So what's 144 million plus 2,071 million? 2,215. 2,2,1,5, is that right? So what's 2,2,1,5 divided by uh, 1.34? divided by 1.26. 113. 113 million. <coughs> and then what is 139 million divided by 1.19? divided by 1.12? 118. What is it? 118. Thank you. <coughs> and what's 120 million divided by 1.06? 113. Uh, 113? Yep. Okay. And what's the present value? Which is 113 plus 118 plus 117 plus 113 plus 1,652 million. Uh, 1,652. No, but just use the, put millions and thousands. 
to make it easy. So 1,652 plus 115, 117, 118, 113, what's the present value? 1,001. What is it? 2,000. 2,000. <coughs> Basically, two billion one hundred and fifteen million, right? Yes. Right. How many? How many minutes do I have left? Five. Five. Okay. I'm, I'm going to get into the the decision stuff, and then we'll do the rest of it uh, on Wednesday. Okay. So, what's the present value? Two billion one. sell you the company but for three three billion dollars. So what's the net present value? What's the net present value? If the acquisition price is three billion and the present value is two point one one three, what's the net present value? Eight hundred and eighty seven million. What is it? Eight hundred and eighty seven million. Yeah but is it positive or negative? Negative. Negative how much? Eight hundred and eighty seven billion. Eight hundred and do we accept or reject it? Reject. Huh? It's pretty big. It's pretty big. But we really want the company. Right? So what would we do? What could we do? If we really wanted this project. And we could go back to the seller and negotiate. Right? What would we negotiate? What would we ask for in the negotiation to make it so that we could get this project? What would we do first? Decrease the cost. No, no, no. Do what? Decrease the cost. Do you want De to decrease, decrease the cost? The cost? Yeah. yeah, by how much? By how much to get this project to be accepted? Eight hundred seven million. You got it. Exactly. We would ask for a price reduction. <coughs> the amount of the negative net present value, you need to write this down. Okay? <clears throat> you need to write it down that you carry this thing out one more year, add some risk premium, <coughs> the going in discount rate, you calculate the terminal value, you add it to the last year's cash flow, you discount it all back to get the present value. Okay? <clears throat> then you get a negative net present value, but you really want the project. You go back and you do a price reduction. You negotiate a price reduction in the amount of the negative net present value. Got it. Because if that happens, if we can do that, then the net present value equals to zero. Do we accept or reject projects when the net present value is equal to zero? Accept. So you accept it. Okay. Excellent. Good job. <coughs> Bad news. Bad news. They will not take a price reduction. What can we do? You recalculate what? Call option. What? Call option. <coughs> no, no, but we're not going to do that yet. Uh, what do we recalculate? What do we do? Rest rates. Uh, yeah. <coughs> Excuse me. You would um, re you would redo the you reevaluate the growth rates in the cash flows. Okay. So you could go back and look at the G's. What else could you do? Yeah, such as give me give me some actual variables within the model that we could review, right? Because we may have underestimated the growth rates and they may actually have been higher. So if G goes up, what happens to net present value? If G goes up, net present value goes. If G goes up, the growth rates and the cash flows go up. Net present value goes up. Okay. What about the discount rate? Could we have overestimated the discount rate? Yeah. Yeah, we could, we, maybe we should have used five. Okay? So maybe we overestimated the discount rate. What else? What other variables in the calculation do we need to go back and reevaluate? What about the terminal discount rate? We have to go back and look at the going in, and we have to look at the terminal discount rate. <coughs> 
when we use too high of a terminal discount rate, that gave us too low of a terminal value, which pushed down our negative net present value. Any other variables? No? Okay, bad news. We use the uh, we use the right assumptions in our sensitivities. Can't get a price reduction. We've, we've reevaluated all the assumptions. Uh, they're correct, and we still want the project. What would we, what would we do? What would we do next? Somebody said it. Call option. Do we calculate a real call option? A real call option. What did you? How much time? minutes. You would calculate a real call option value. What does the real call option value need to be to accept this project? How much value in the real call option is needed to accept this project? What do you need? What's the value, what's the dollar value of the real call option you need to be to accept this project? What does it need to be? <coughs> Say that one. 887 million. 887 million. So if the real call option value is equal to or greater than the eight negative 887 million, would you accept or reject the project? Accept. You would accept it because the net net present value is going to be equal to zero. You accept the project. And the factors that drive real call option values is time, management decision and price volatility, value volatility. Are tech companies volatile yes. in value? Yeah. yeah. So what I'll do is I'll map out the, uh, the matrix. We'll go through this again. This was an acquisition of a firm. You can do this <coughs> with real estate. You can do this um, with uh, capital budgets. Okay, it's the same basic equation used over and over again.